All right, we are now live. So welcome everyone officially now to the uh, third annual North Carolina Autistic Career Summit. I'm still trying to teach myself to look into the camera, even though we've been on Zoom for a while, it's hard not to look at the screen, but you know, I, I don't get to see all of you. So I'm really, I'm just staring at myself at this point in time, wondering if uh, my face is uh, too shiny for all the lights that's going on here. Um, I am coming to you. Uh, it looks like I'm coming to you from like a basement that I do podcasts in. I, I'm actually coming to you from uh, NC State here. Uh, I work in the Career Development Center. Right now, I am in the College of Sciences, which is the primary college I serve. I, I am the career counselor for the College of Sciences. My name is Wesley Wade. My pronouns are he, him. I also um, work with military and veteran students on campus. Uh, I've been on the advisory council for the Black Male Initiative, which is a learning and living village here at North Carolina um, that CJ Jackson runs, does a great job with that. Uh, and I also run the Students Moving Forward program, uh, which uh, Dana Thomas and I co-founded um, a while back. Uh, about This is the fifth year of the program and um, I run and operate the uh, North Carolina Autistic Career Summit. And we are in the third year for that now. Um, I do want to make a quick point that we do have a live captioner here. And um, if you go down at the bottom of Zoom and you hit closed captions, you will be able to see that. There is a link for the stream text. Um, Becky, I, I do not, uh, I, gotta, I gotta dig to find that link. Uh, do you have, I, well, you can't do two things at once. You're you're over here doing this. Let me um, let me get that link for you so I can um, uh, send it out here. We for those of you who are just coming in, we had some uh, a few quick technical difficulties. We got them set. We are ready to go. Um, and I just realized I need to send a link for those who want to use the stream text. Um, in addition to this, and I thought I had. That. I have placed in the chat, Wade. Oh, perfect. Look at it. This is why I have people uh, who are amazing to help me out because I have no idea what's going on sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Appreciate it. All right. I am going to put this out to everyone. Here you go. All right, for those who want to use the stream text, which you can have like a separate window where it's going to have live captions and you can adjust the size of the captions, the color of the captions in the background, a little bit of a delay there, but you also have your live captioning um, option here uh, in, in Zoom as well. So I'm, I'm only going to take a few minutes because we are starting a little bit behind due to some of the technical difficulties. Um, and you know these issues do happen all the time. Thank you. So I, I was trying not to stress two bags. At this point, we're all here, and I'm excited that we are all here. Um, some of the things that I had wanted to talk about was just briefly like the history of how we got here, which was the beginning of the Students Moving Forward program. And um, I'm going to quote some things from Judy in our conversation. Judy Singer and I, who is the opening keynote here, she and I've had uh, about four or five conversations over the past two months or so, just getting to know each other, getting comfortable. And we would talk for two and three hours <laughs> when we were only supposed to talk for like 30 minutes or 45 minutes or 60 minutes. And we just really enjoyed having a great conversation. Judy Singer is um, the Australian sociologist who uh, coined the term neurodiversity and is the first person to write about the new sociological movement, sociopolitical movement of the career, uh, neuro, I was about to say career development, the neurodiversity movement. Uh, and neurodiversity is a little bit more complex than people tend to realize. So um, in the video, Judy and I will talk about that. But in one of our conversations, Judy had mentioned um, being, uh, how did she phrase it, a habitually defiant person. And we were both talking about that because I think there's points in times in my life um, and by points in times, I mean my whole life of being labeled as a habitually defiant person. And, you know, to quote John Lewis, I mean, good, good type of fun, um, uh, good type of trouble. Uh, sometimes there's good trouble to get into. Um, so there's certain causes that I am more than willing to push the envelope on because they need to and they need more visibility. 
So the Students Moving Forward program had started because Dana Thomas and I uh, realized that we had two students who were amazing and they were great and they were having a struggle getting some career opportunities despite having over 3.0 GPAs. One of them had a 4.0 GPA. They were very personable. They were charismatic. Uh, one of them has a slight speech impediment and we noticed that that also hindered her on some of her um, interviews because people didn't understand what that was. And honestly, we didn't know a lot about autism. I had never heard the word neurodiversity at that point. This was uh, during 2017. And the very first year of the Students Moving Forward program, it was a learning process for us. And the Students Moving Forward program is a career-focused program here at NC State. We've run out of the Career Development Center that is focused for NC State students um, just really to help build community, but the primary focus of that is to help students get paid internship experience so they can move into degree-related at-level full-time employment. Because what you see is a lot of students who are neurodivergent, especially um, autistic students, students on the autism spectrum, and I will go back and forth between um, identity first language and saying students on the autism spectrum just out of respect because I know people um, like to define in different ways. So th th those are the two that I use based on the neurodiversity movement and uh, the research that indicates the um, range, the wide range and majority of um, autistic adults prefer identity first language. And in that first year was rough. We, we, well, when I say rough, it was rough in terms, we, we realized that there was a lot we didn't know. The students were great. We had a good time. We had engagement with the Disability Resource Office on campus, the Counseling Center on campus. And um, NC State has over 35,000, over 37,000 students enrolled undergrad and, uh, and grad school. But at that point, there was only about like 46 or 49 students registered as being on the spectrum with the Disability Resource Office. That number is entirely low. There's research that indicates that the percentage is around 1% that re on any college campus in the United States. And that was about, that research came out in about 2014 or 2015. It's 2021, I guarantee you that that number is higher. And that number isn't higher because there is a higher rate of occurrence. That number is higher because assessments have become better they have become more culturally um, accessible and um, appropriate for different populations to take them. Um, there are more practitioners. There is a, a greater awareness and um, a, a, a increasing greater acceptance. And we, we really want to go from awareness to acceptance. Um, and we want to build this narrative within the environments in which, which we live. So that percentage is increasing. And we had a lot to learn. And I, I am someone who tries to work on extending grace. And for me, I realized I was doing the same thing in that program that uh, many of us don't like in programming. If you were going to a program for um, Black professionals in the workplace or women in STEM, and everyone on the panel was someone not from those groups you would not be a big fan of what was going on. You would say, where, where is the representation here? And um, I realized that I was doing the same thing and I don't, I don't want to be someone who was doing that. I um, wanted to make sure that we had more authentic representation um, that was there. And that is when uh, we started partnering with uh, Danielle Pavlov at SAS and has been an amazing partner for everything that we do here. Thank you, SAS, so much. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, um, SAS is one of our sponsors here for um, the closing keynote with Eric Garcia. Um, IBM and NetApp collaboratively are the sponsors for Judy Singer and our accessibility services that we have. And uh, the Career Services Office out of the UNC Charlotte uh, University over here in, in the Queen City, a few uh, hours down the road is the sponsor for our uh, student awards that we have. And Danielle Pavlov put me in touch with Magnus Hedemark, who has become a great friend, who is going to be on our response panel to the recording of Judy Singer. And that allowed the Students Moving Forward program to become very authentic, to become a program that had representation from the community. When I realized I had made that error, I'm a big fan in owning up to the errors that I make um, because we, we all make errors. And I think if we all 
uh, just took the time to say, yes, I made this mistake and this is what I'm doing about it and we're moving on, I think we would be talking a lot less about cancel culture and everything else because it's really about, we all make mistakes, but how are you responding to that? And um, started building uh, authentic representation in the group. We have a professional advisory board that is diverse racially, ethnically, gender-wise, um, and, and uh, career-wise. And this is not just for people who are in STEM. We have a lot of people who are in computer programming or in different areas of STEM. I have students who are studying genetics. I have students who are studying zoology. I have students in political sciences and chemistry and history. Uh, students who are studying um, other languages. There is as much diversity and the neurodivergent, specifically the autistic community, because this summit is about the autistic community as specifically, as there are in any other population. And sometimes this gets lost in these narratives that we have here. Um, there can also be some contention uh, between these two groups. Uh, and by these two groups, I mean people who embrace neurodiversity and people who really don't like it. And what tends to happen is there is not an accurate understanding of what neurodiversity really is. And neurodiversity is for everyone. Um, the other, and we'll talk more about neurodiversity in our conversation with Judy that I'm about to play here. Um, there is, um, there is uh, a quote that I was going to use, but technology issues have kind of pushed me down. I was gonna share my screen here and do a poll for you. Um, but people get misunderstood often. Civil rights movements, social justice movements get misunderstood often. And the neurodiversity movement is a social justice movement. That is one of the three components of the, um, what I call the theor theoretical framework of, of neurodiversity. There are no social justice or civil rights movements that are clean and that are neat and that are tidy. The Black American civil rights movement of Martin Luther King um, and other folks and SNCC and all their people who were in that 60s and you know late 50s era was very different from the Black Lives Matter movement that we have going on now. And Martin Luther King got a lot of criticism when he was alive. A lot of people who say they like him now did not like him <laughs> back in that day. It, um, they also operated on a philosophy called the perfect victim st uh, strategy. So if you do some digging, you will understand that Rosa Parks was not the first woman to um, do a boycott on a bus. I, and I don't remember the person's name because again, technology, I don't have my slides and that is my, my fault. Um, but the very first person was a darker skinned black woman who did a bus boycott. She was a teenager. I think she got pregnant at an early age when she was an adolescent. She didn't fit the narrative of a perfect victim. And what we mean by a perfect victim, it is a person that will feel more palatable to um, the majority, the people that we are. Thank you, Claudette COVID. Thank you very much. Um, for a, a, a perfect victim is a person who would feel more palatable to the people we are reaching out to, right? A lot of people weren't fans of that. A lot of people weren't fans that they thought MLK was putting um, college students in the line of jeopardy, right? Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is more of a grassroots movement. It is not organized uh, intentionally, and it does not operate on the perfect victim strategy. It says it doesn't matter if someone was an imperfect person because we all are. Um, this person still has rights and they have the respect to dignity. So these two movements were very different. And my purpose of stating these things is that there doesn't have to be 100% consensus in any social justice movement. No group is a monolith. There will never be 100% cons consensus within any group or in any social justice movement. Our role is to navigate this, um, to seek understanding when people are um, validating our humanity and our experiences. And I tell my students and my clients as well, my private practice is, you can't agree or disagree with someone until you understand them, uh, assuming that that person validates your humanity. I do, I do wanna make very clear about that. Um, but you have to understand someone. Just because I understand you doesn't mean I agree with you, but we need to seek understanding. And so, um, I'm going to get started with the video here, uh, but I wanted to 
um, begin our session and our, our welcome message with that. And uh, I'm laughing because I think I had some technical difficulties at the beginning last year as well. And I didn't get to do my full <laughs> welcome message, but I think we got to do enough. And I really enjoyed this conversation that I have coming up with Judy. I had to edit this um, because it was over three hours long. We had a really deep, wonderful conversation. Uh, Judy and I will continue talking because she's just a, a, become a really good friend. Um, and uh, my editing skills are not great. So you're gonna see some very sharp pivots in some of these, but I think, it, I think it's well, and it's about 58 minutes long. So I condensed a three hour plus conversation into a 58 minute um, discussion here and I, I enjoyed it and Judy got to watch it too and she she enjoyed it as well so I'm going to play this after we release the Snyder Cut <laughs> I got you I got you so um, I'm going to play this we'll take a brief five minute break after this um, and then get ready for the response panel uh, and we might go a little bit over 1130 because and I know you know we're all on time constraints but just because we did get started a little bit behind here. So without further ado, let me share our video with Judy. All right, here we go, everyone. So I am here with Judy Singer, and I am very excited. I've gotten to know Judy a little bit over uh, the course of these conversations that we've had. Uh, I guess it's been about two months. And if you don't know Judy, you probably know her work because her honors thesis, her honors sociology thesis is responsible for coining the, uh, the term neurodiversity, or as I like to refer to the, the framework, the conceptual framework of neurodiversity, because it's a little bit more complex than people tend to understand. And, and they throw, we throw the word around a little loosely sometimes. So I am here with Judy, and she's coming to us from Australia, and I am uh, here in the U.S., so uh, who says that we can't play nicely together? <laughs> well, thank you, and since I'm here in Australia, I've got to do something that is now standard in any kind of academics or corporate setting, and that is um, a welcome to country. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but basically we, we name the original area um in in the, before colonization and acknowledge the country that we come from so i come from sydney which is and i come from uh, broadcasting from the um the ancestral home of the gadigal people of the Eora nation and i honor the elders past and present and um, I really like the idea of elders because I'm an elder myself now, or I want to be seen as one. I mean, and I grew up in the, in the 60s, never trust anyone in the 30s who's <laughs> 30. And now I'd, I don't want to pay that price anymore. So I'd like to be a neurodiversity elder. You are, you are definitely the neurodiversity elder. Uh, many of us have lovingly called you the uh, fairy godmother of neurodiversity. Uh, 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 Magnus was, uh, Magnus Hedemark was the first person who, who uh, showed me that term and I, I have found it very endearing since then. Well, I actually told Magnus that, you know, I said, you can think of me as a fairy godmother of neurodiversity. <laughs> I really um, like credited for all my phrases. What, what you did at the beginning there over here, we call it uh, a land acknowledgement and uh, I, I, this is another reason why I have enjoyed conversations with you. It's, uh, it's a great sense of honesty. We've, uh, I think we found out that we have a lot in common, although you are much more experienced and traveled and uh, everything than I am, but it's been fun to learn from an elder in your diversity and in, in life in general. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start with the first questions. We, we've, we've talked a lot about a lot of different topics. So we're, We'll try to keep it as condensed and maybe even the magic of editing can, can help sometimes here. With neurodiversity, um, a lot of people have different understandings of it. Sometimes they haven't read your work to really understand that there are you know, multiple components of it. For you, what are some aspects of the neurodiversity framework 
that you see people get wrong that you wish they understood? Well, first of all, when I, I realised that language evolves and I didn't, I don't own the term just because I kind of happen to be in the right place at the right time to pronounce it. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, I have quite strong feelings about it. Um, so what I find very upsetting is when people use neurodiversity as a synonym for neurological disability. And that just means that once again, we're, we're um, into othering people with um, these neurologically labeled conditions. For me, neurodiversity is a fact about the planet. It relates to a place. We are a neurodiverse planet. Um, it's based on the concept of biodiversity. You wouldn't talk about, you know, Skippy is a is a neurotypical kangaroo, but I don't know. Skippy's uh, Skippy's little Joe, little Joey. Okay, little Joey is is a is a bio is biodiverse. You know, like that's just completely ridiculous. And it's really important because for me, um, neurodiversity, I used it to name a movement. I didn't think people were going to use it to see it as a disability, but it was about the importance of neurodiversity just at, to culture as biodiversity is important to ecosystems in the sense that the more diverse uh, uh, biota is the more um, sustainable um, and um, productive it is. And so I was hoping that neurodiversity would be something similar. Maybe I'm not so keen on productivity, but I couldn't remember the other adjective. So yes, okay. I mean, from a business point of view, productivity is important. Mm -hmm. um, but from a broader point of view, maybe not. So that's my main my main problem with it. Another thing that really upsets me is there's all these um, definitions of neurodiversity floating around, and both they originate in Wikipedia, and people have not done their research, and people in Wikipedia had no expertise; they just assumed. And the, the thing that gets me is that when they say neurodiversity is a, a is a normal variation of the human of, in humans. Well, if everyone is is normal, normal has no meaning. And also, what do they even mean by normal? If they're trying to say neurodiversity is like rainbows and sunshine normal and nice, well, human nature is not like that. And so to me, it's just a kind of really happy, clappy, thoughtless um, kind of lazy shorthand. It's not that at all. Yeah, I, 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 we had talked about that a little bit because um, I was, you had tested me one day when I thought like four or five times and you were like, well, what do you think about this? And uh, I, I knew I was being tested and I was trying to break down the, the um, biological diversity aspect of it from a biodiversity perspective, but also the neurodiversity paradigm and then the neurodiversity movement, which um, uh, Dr. Nick Walker, she has some great writing on that. It helped me understand that further as well. It was really clear and concise because uh, I felt a little embarrassed when you had first said it because before I had really understood it, I used that same phrasing and we all grow and learn. That's, that's something that's important to me is that, you know, none of us are going to get everything right all the time. I to say I was not testing you. I was just trying to see how you received it, but that's, you know, <laughs> red pencil, my friends, you know, so I can be told me that before and I haven't let it go. Yeah. <laughs> on Twitter and I'll give you hell, but in a conversation, I'm much more forgiving. Right. Well, you know, what else is Twitter for besides that? Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate you saying that because you said that before as well. And, you know, I, it's, you know, I'm talking to the fairy godmother of diversity. So, you know, it, it, it felt a little pressure for me, but I was glad that I understood um, enough to, read your work enough and you know some work of other people to understand that component. I also do want to acknowledge that we're only a few minutes into this conversation and I'm talking to someone from Australia and we have already mentioned kangaroos. So this is already going great for all the Americans. We're like, this is this is fantastic. This is 
yeah. lived up to all the stereotypes we have about Australia. <laughs> might hear a kookaburra in a minute if you're lucky. <laughs> um, so uh, with the productivity piece, which you were talking about, right, with neurodiversity, and sometimes it can get lumped into with that, um, there's, there can be like contention with neurodiversity where you have uh, at times some organizations, not everyone, but it's, it's only from an aspect of you know, productivity. And then you have other people who just don't like the term because they feel that it is limiting to disability. Um, how do you feel about the relationship between disability and uh, neurodiversity? Well, it depends what you mean by disability, um, whether you're talking about the medical model of disability, something wrong with the individual that, that medicine and psychology can fix or try to fix, or the social model, which says that, well, the extreme social model would say, which I don't adhere to, by the way, would say that um, it's all society creates disability. Um, by some barriers, um, you know, the obvious thing is, is um, you know, no ramps for wheelchairs, that kind of thing. Um, I don't agree with that extreme view. Um, I just think it's, a, it's an interaction between, between impairments within the individual that make it hard to function, that require a lot of support, um, and versus... Um, and environments that make it worse or don't help or don't accommodate it. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? It, it, it does. And um, I appreciate you saying that because when in your, in, in your book, if, if people haven't read that, it's the, it's, well, it, in one part, it's a reprint of the honors thesis, but you also have a really interesting introduction in there, which I appreciate because it's, I think it was written or published around 2017. And it's a different person, I won't say it's a different perspective, but we get to hear your voice as someone who has grown and had a lot of life experience from the time that they wrote their honors thesis. And it's, it, it, it has like a meta feel to it where you're saying that I, I intentionally was trying to push the envelope some because it needed to be pushed because this was an important social justice movement. I, I, and when I'm saying I am pretending I am you, uh, which is a wonderful uh, delusion of grandeur for me to have here, um, but that you were intentionally pushing the envelope to create this social justice movement and you know, uh, looked at, you know, civil rights movements and uh, feminist movements and really took a lot of motivation from that. And you were pretty clear in there about like, you know, as you framed it, the extreme social um, model that you weren't really a, a, a fan of. So I do, I, I think that clarity is something that people need to be, need to be aware of, at least in terms of like your perspective and the origins of this. And, you know, the fact that you also said, like, you don't own the word, like you, you put this out here and it has, this is, this is what happens with uh, organic uh, movements. They, they grow on their own. They take on their own shape. They're never clean and tidy. They, they tend to be pretty messy. I'll just do a bit of sociology here, sociology light, because I only have a sociology light degree. But <laughs> it's a dialectic process of change, you know, where I have, someone has an idea, it's actually called a thesis. Okay, so I had a thesis. And then People say, well, it doesn't fit me. It's the and it's a terrible idea. Here's the antithesis. And you know, they're all my trolls on Twitter, amongst other things. And then out of that evolves a new synthesis or a compromise. And then that has this, you know, so it keeps evolving. And yet I just still keep my oar in for what, what I want it to mean. And that's what my role is, I suppose. Um, but what I did say, it's very, it's very unfair because, um, you know, I get blamed for being an extreme social modelist. And what I wrote in my thesis, if you, if you read it, I decided that the extreme social model was so, was so extreme that it might have been, might as well have been creationist for its um, lack of mentioning of biology as if bio biology didn't exist. So I, I'm a sort of centrist, I think, in that way. Yeah, you were you were pretty clear about your own like family history with disability and um, 
it, it's I mean, you didn't mince words. It was it was pretty clear in there. And I, I appreciated that clarity because uh, most of us, you know, have some um, relationship with disability, whether it is our own or our family members or friends. And um, that can give us different perspectives on it. Certainly, you know, you know, no group is a monolith. Um, but your honors thesis really has helped to organize a movement and energize people. And for me, you know, finding it in my late 30s, knowing that I probably was ADHD, but finding it in my late 30s, even as a licensed clinician, still gave me a level of clarity and understanding and belongingness that I, I felt surprised that I could feel at this point in time. I, I kind of thought I had already achieved those levels and that now I'm moving on to other things. So there is a, to me, it's a unifying thing. I don't, uh, I think when people see it as divisive, it's just something, you know, this is my uh, mental health counselor hat coming on. They are projecting other things within them. I can't speak for other people. That's how I feel. Um, but for me, it's been very unifying. All of us, right? Neurodiversity is every human on the planet and neurodiversity is a challenge to society or the movement is to include everybody as much as they can or if you know and when it comes to uh, severe disability a word you're not allowed to use but I'm going to use it anyway because it's such shorthand um, and to me all right sorry I know it's what is it um, high support needs yeah mm -hmm. that's fine with me I should be using that term because it's true but you know high support need means needs means that your mother usually or your parents have to put all their time into you, you know, like call it what you like. Um, and now I've forgotten what I was going to say. This is, oh, by the way, that comes with being an elder. I'm 70. I've got a very poor memory, short term memory. Yeah. Uh, so your memory is on par for 38 ADHD mans. <laughs> so what I think one of the things I wanted to say was that the way that I, um, described myself as being in the middle of three generations of women somewhere on the autistic yes. spectrum and that my subject positions and experiences were um, different in for all, were different for all those and sometimes you know contradictory um, my mother had uh, ADA, had um sorry my mind's gone blank here for a moment my mother had um, was was on the spectrum and also had PTSD from her wartime experience as a Holocaust survivor. So, you know, that didn't help. And um, she was not really capable of mothering. So I had that experience. Then, you know, I had my daughter who um, was more like my mother, like basically I'm a very logical, rational, I sort of inherited that from somewhere. And my, my mother and daughter are more kind of poets, fangirls, writers, that kind of thing, and not in, not logical. So, you know, there was there were stresses in our relationship because of that. Um, and and then I myself, um, well, I was always an outsider and I couldn't quite understand why. Why do people always talk over me? You wouldn't think it, but they do. Mm. And you know, why was I unpopular? I was so, you know, I was always nice and truthful and honest and all the rest of it. Um, and I was horribly abused for being uh, un non athletic, you know, very nerdy and um, feeble. So, you know, different experiences. Um, you know, some people will, there's a real kind of anti parent thing happening in a lot of um, new social movements. At, because mm. they're usually by young people who haven't been parents. So, you know, there's a lot of attack on autistic mothers, which is really, um, I don't, you know, I get pretty fierce about that um, because mothers right. are under pressure. And it's, and it's not easy having a child who's different, particularly back in the day when my daughter was born, when no one even knew what Asperger's was or right. has been. And it was like, we believed, and I had believed it until I had a huge wake-up call, the children were bl blank slates. And if they, if they weren't acting the way they should, as society deemed, then it was the mother's fault. So we were dealing with all that as well. So many different subject positions, not easily reconciled. But it's, now, it's not. Well, now, because I understand, you know, I mean, when I think back about the pressures that my mother was under to be normal, 
when she was clearly, in fact, where my work actually got known was that I wrote an article. Um, I wrote, it was a, a summary of my thesis it was in um, the Open University Press in the UK, and it was titled um, From a Problem with No Name, which is what we, I had, yeah. to a new category of disability. And the subtitle was, why can't you be normal for once in your life? Which is what my, my I said to my mother all the time, why can't you be normal for once in your life? And mm. my father used to say it to me sometimes. Why can't you, you know, why don't you just get married and have girlfriends and, you know, become a doctor? Like what's stopping you? So. I share that experience to a degree. I have a loving family. As they see this, I love you, I <laughs> but I, 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 I do ruffle feathers at times. Um, um, so I want to, because I, I don't want to get like too off the rails and have one of our conversations oh, that we have been having uh, that I have early enjoyed. Much. It's up to you. I don't mind. Oh, well, great. So um, the, the tying back to like the producti uh, productivity piece we had mentioned earlier, which, um, you know, elements of truth there within it but when it's extreme like when a lot of things are extreme it um it can be hurtful it can be limiting it can be some other things as well we know that uh rates for um or uh, autistic unemployment rates mm -hmm. have been um uh, low right i mean they've been uh, dramatically low and uh, there's a large rate of underemployment and it's pretty abysmal and that's a reason why there's a lot of you know, autism to work programs, or they'll uh, call it a neurodiversity program. A lot of times it'll only target autism, which, you know, us ADHD folks need help as well. Most, most people, including neurotypical folks could benefit from supports. Um, so if the rise in neurodiversity and autism to work programs, you know, it can feel good to see those things as they're coming into motion or giving people opportunities who should have opportunities, right? It's not a charity. They should, they, they are more than deserving of these opportunities. Um, but sometimes when you dig deeper, there can be gaps and at times things can feel a little off. So mm -hmm. I would like to know from the fairy godmother of neurodiversity, if you had full control to design your own, we'll, we'll call it a neurodiversity to work program because you are Judy Singer, the, the god, uh, fairy godmother of neurodiversity. If you had, if you were able to design your own neurodiversity to work program, what would that look like? Oh my God, I should have given this more thought. <laughs> well, this is great because then we can just, we, we can get that pure, <laughs> that pure, uh, uh, just pure stream ignorance. of consciousness. Pure distillation of pure ignorance. Um, you might start another movement. Yeah, well, <laughs> all right. Well, you know, I'm not really good at positive thinking. I can, I'm much better at negative thinking. All right, so what I would do, is, you see, I can't see the workplace in isolation. I'm sorry. Like people have to get to the place where they have to get the degree. They have to have the education to get to that place. Who's getting that education? And that brings in all the other intersectionalities, you know, like obviously gender, race, class, all the other things. So equal equalizing opportunity right through the system. Um, and then, um, once someone has got the qualifications, um, at the moment, what we're seeing is seems like a worldwide trade in male computer programmers. Um, I don't think they call that anymore. I used to be a female computer programmer, by the way. Oh my God, but we won't go there. And um, <laughs> so, what we, what what we need to see is what. And I suppose, you know, we're talking gender differences here. Um, you know, what, what women and girls, often girls are writers, um, creators in, in certain ways. And then of course, some of them, well, I was one, I've already said that. I might say it again, just in case you have to edit it in that I was a computer programmer myself because that was one of the few equal opportunities for university dropouts, which is what I was in the 60s and 70s because um, whatever, because I had so many problems from, you know, my background. 
and um, so that's the first thing. Then, so again, to talk, to put it into into the perspective of the bigger system, I wonder how many for each person that's hired, how many people miss out on the job and what happens mm. to them? They might be second best by this much. Well, right. for all those people, you know, if you're a corporate, you've got to have some social responsibility. You've got to have some, you've got to be pressuring governments to say, okay, we need a living wage mm -hmm. for people who are on unemployment benefits because there's 20 applicants. I don't know. I went for a job recently that, well, not recently, forget that, leave that out. Um, you know, sometimes there are hundreds of applicants. What happens to them? So we look after everyone. So what you do, you know, it's, it's not enough to tick boxes. Um, you've got to be socially responsible. Um, another thing that needs to happen is checks and balances. And I know that some people are doing this kind of research, like what is the experience of people who have been in these programs? So they have, there has to be transparency there. Um, in terms of um, accommodations, like for me, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not an organisational anything. It's like basically it's kindness, it's self-awareness, it's knowing about the manifestations of these uh, disabilities. Uh, uh, it's knowing, it's knowing what is nature, what is the person's essence that they can't change and what they can change and what they can be accommodated for. It's not expecting mm -hmm. things to be all the roses and sunshine. It's not, we all have to make compromises. And that even includes neurodivergent people. You know, we all have to try and cooperate. We all have to push ourselves a little to cooperate, I think. Right. Um, hmm. Well, that's enough to be going on with. <laughs> we could write a whole nother thesis also, just on that. You know, the old thing that used to be called the Peter Principle, don't promote people beyond their capacity, you know, don't turn a computer no. program into an administrator or a HR person or, and don't turn a HR person or a sociologist into a computer programmer, which is a tragedy right. that befell me. So there's a lot of depth in what you said, in addition to what I just want to imagine is a kookaburra in the background that I keep hearing. And I'm like, if, if there's any way to derail a conversation with an autistic person and an ADHD person, it's have a, have a kookaburra in the background <laughs> chirping, but uh, somehow we managed through and, and, and we are still well, here. If you hear, they don't chirp, that it's, it's raucous laughter, but don't take it personally. If you hear. <laughs> there's not many kookaburras around here. Okay. I, 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 raucous laughter is what I imagine in my head when I tell a joke, but it's it's usually just me who's laughing most of the time. So, you know, from your, you know, uh, sage wisdom here for um, autistic populations, for neurodivergent populations in general, where is that line between what we are compromising and what the uh, employer is compromising like where like where and, and it's not it's subjective but, but where is that line well i just want to say that before which i didn't say before that i didn't define neurodiversity all i said was that i suggested it as a name for a social movement and in addition to the categories of intersectionality and I'm th I've been thinking a lot more about intersectionality and it's not just this plum, this plum in the pudding and that one and that one and that one. I reckon, you know, you could almost, I reckon you should rate them, you know, like you get so many for being black, you get so many for being gender different, you can get so many mm -hmm. for being, you know, a diaspora person and so on. So... You know, people, there is no line, is there? Well, right. again, you know, I kind of understand um, that in America, the the um, black civil rights issue is mm. is very strong, and it's it's strong here in Australia for Indigenous people as well. Right. And 
I don't know, you just got to keep fighting and you just got to keep, sometimes you have to pass and sometimes you don't. I should say that I'm not, I don't identify as white, I identify as a Semite and I do an enormous amount of passing um, mm -hmm. as well. And it's, it can be really infuriating and, and, and it just can make you so angry in the background and, you know, you're supposed to come to work. And I'm sure every minority feels that you have to mm. come to work and you put a lot of that aside because that's not what work is about. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'm not suggesting we go into a revolution now and destroy all work <laughs> by any means. Right, right. You know, and yeah. It, it's, it is not easy and you know, I, I find it, and I said this a little bit earlier, but I find it very easy, uh, very interesting when people have, uh, like now, you know, we have uh, different opinions on everything and everyone, and we should have different opinions on stuff uh, to a degree. <laughs> and uh, with uh, the neurodiversity movement, that's usually what people are really referring to when they're talking about neurodiversity is, um, can be, um, it, it, it can, you know, push people over into uh, different camps at points in time, right? And uh, for that misunderstanding, as we were talking about earlier, their conception of it without having, you know, really read your work or some other really good works on neurodiversity as well. And um, it, it's, it's like any social justice movement, like no social justice movement was nice and tidy they're, 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 they are messy things. And especially when it's a, a, a whole framework, when it's a theoretical concept, there's, there's a lot in there and it's, it's gonna move and grow on its own. And there's never gonna be complete consensus. I think what you're trying to say is that all movements polarize and that is part of the human nature and that has evolutionary benefit. Um, that, was, that was perfect, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, With, um, well, like uh, going, getting back to the productivity thing and we're uh, the uh, Judy Singer's neurodiversity to work program is what we're going to frame it. We're, we're going to get a big neon sign and that's what it's going to say. Um, the corporate responsibility. Let's talk more about that because I sometimes people ask me questions about um, the programs that I do, like the Students Moving Forward program at NC State, which is a career focused program. And uh, we collaborate with other partners in the state, like uh, the Lincoln Internship Program and UNC Teach and SAS and other corporations and other institutions. And there's a lot of good that comes out of that. Um, you know, but there's a whole state and country and world, and there's people doing this. And there is a role of corporate responsibility here. So, like, what is what really is the corporate responsibility for Judy Singer's neuro, neurodiversity to work program? Well, corporations a lot, have a lot of power. And as I keep saying, it's, you have to exercise that responsibility in your nation as well as in your particular workplace. Um, you have to make sure you, you have to you have to do your lobbying. You have to pay your taxes. Sorry, um, <laughs> get educated so that more people can get the education they need, um, so that there's adequate um, safety nets for people that you don't employ. Um, within your corporations, I've said it before, you know, be kind. And don't forget that neurodiversity is not just autism and all the rest of it. It's been very, and neurodiversity, ADHD, and the, the DIS sisters, I call them, Lexia, Calculia, and Praxia. It's not just all those. It's mm. also narcissism and psychopathy, which I believe are also neurological characteristics. So, you know, you just got to do the human thing like humans have always done. You, you want to make put the right people in the right jobs um, mm. with a certain degree of responsibility. You know, don't make people managers if they're, if they're kind of got, if they're computer programmers and that, that kind of vision, 
don't put psychopaths in charge of people just because they charmed you at an interview. You know, it was yeah. all a lot about how we change. Oh, so this is where all the experts come in and they've got all sorts of tips on how to make interviews more inclusive, you know, don't insist on eye contact. Um, outline what the job really is, not, you know, what the personality characters or what they actually have to do, try, you know, test people on the job, all those things. I think they're all coming in anyway. So, you know, I do think that this movement has actually already achieved a lot. I've got to say that. Um, mm -hmm. Being a habitually oppositional defiant person, which I try not to show in my interviews, but I have to admit, you know, it has, um, things are changing. They might have changed anyway because the autism, I mean, all I did was what, you know, follow in the footsteps of the autism self-advocacy movement, mm -hmm. which absolutely pioneered all this and then attracted all the, you know, ADHD and all the things and it was immersed in disability studies. Yeah, we're changing. And, you know, for me, I the way we are now, we've got both economies, so everyone's got to keep growing, which is just, well, it's unsustainable. And I've always wanted to, I always hoped that this, this movement would make, would make the corporate world more humane, mm -hmm. simply more productive. Um, and yet I understand that, I understand how, why we've got this system, we've just got to keep being productive in the, I don't even want to bring the environment in, but I will because yeah. the more we produce, the more we wreck everything. And somehow this has got to change. And I'm not being a HR person or a psychologist about how to fit people in. I just want to look at, at the whole system. And, and yet I think we are making it more humane. And who knows what good things may come of it. I think we have the official title for your program. It is the Judy Singer Neurodiversity to Work Program, Making Corporations More Humane. I think I think that's that's the title. We're gonna get some neon signs and we're gonna hang that on your new office building that we're gonna build for you down there in Oz. And um, and we're gonna get started with that. I I appreciate hearing that because. Um, I do see movement and it's hard because we want progress and we want it quickly because people are suffering. People are, are hurting for, for no reason at all. Sometimes job applications, <clears throat> excuse me, can feel like popularity contests at points in times. Uh, we want, like you, you hear a job description and it'll say things along the lines of, we want someone who's enthusiastic and who is a rock star and who has a go-getter mentality. And I, re I remember being 16 years old because my dad was st stressing to me how I need to get a job. And I've had, had, had many jobs by the time I was 16, but um, I was reading these job descriptions and I was like, what does this mean? I have like, I don't want to be these things. If they are what I think, I don't, it just, it's very ambiguous and it, it just feels very fake. And it's, it, if you feel very wrong about lying, it's like, why am I going to go here and lie to people? Even though I'm, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's not logical to me at points in time. Um, for an autistic sort of person or person on the spectrum, and by that I mean, and by the way, I have other traits as well that are autistic and dyspraxic is even more, been caused me more grief than even being autistic because that kind of made me brainy, I suppose. But it also made me just want to be really truthful. And, you know, people would ask, it would just kill me. Why do you want to, why do you want this job? You know, that kind of question. And it was like, because I've got to pay the rent. That's why I want it. And, um, and I'm prepared to put up with a whole lot of stuff to do it. <laughs> you know, don't ask people stupid leading questions like that. I agree. So, uh, so uh, maybe it's not, you know, I'm not um, downing anyone's work. There's many great uh, studies out there that are trying to help look at all these different ways to interview. And I think that they have merit in um, certain contexts in their own sense we can do a really good job of overcomplicating things too. And a lot of times it's just as simple as just writing a job description that 
uh, is less words versus more. And we, as a career counselor at a university, um, myself, uh, people who work in employer relations, we are frequently asking employers to write more concise job descriptions so people will actually read them and to have the job description speak directly to what you are actually looking for. That that's step one. That's that's that. I, I don't always know if we need a, um, a a random control study to understand that process, right? No, you're right. I'm um, just. Do you have selection criteria in, for job applications where you've got to answer ten selection criteria? Um, for some types of roles, there 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 can be, but. Uh, not for like private sector things, typically, if I'm, if I'm understanding what you're saying when you say a selection criteria. So maybe if you could elaborate on that and uh, so we could be clear. Well, they, they'll say things like um, demonstrate your commitment to, this is often government jobs, which I've often applied for. And it's, and, uh, it's like, uh, demonstrate your commitment to anti-discrimination or demonstrate your ability to this, that, or the other, or, oh, look, and to me, I just feel like I've got a practical PhD in how to answer these stupid questions, particularly because most of them, a lot of them just even ask the same question in slightly different, no, it's just, I feel so sorry for anyone who has to go through that. It's, it's, I always wanted, I would have been happiest, and I think this is true of many people, an apprenticeship type situation, you know, if you if you really want to do something, go and do work experience there, uh, or or be a, or demonstrate what you can do. Um, yeah, uh, uh, an opportunity uh, apprenticeship internship. We have a program here in the states called co-op, which is like a rotational internship program. NC State has a great co-op program. And there are opportunities for students, young workers, uh, to show what they can do, and they get solid opportunities. There's not like a always a huge GPA um, wall for these things, and it's 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 an opportunity to really showcase your skills and your talent. I um have a lot of uh, stories that I won't go into about those questions excuse me, that you mentioned on those, uh, some of these uh, interviews, and I hear stories from my students, and they are uh, very uh, concerned, and they're frustrated. Uh, uh, I was trying to say flustered, and I said fl frustrated. Uh, fl I just made a new word there. M maybe I'll start a movement, it'll be the, the, the frustrated movement. Um, they were very flustered. They were very frustrated. And I mean, this is even my neurotypical students. These are my neurodivergent and my neurotypical students. It's the, I, I tend to find it's, over overall, it's the same experience, but it's just exacerbated. Like the negative aspects are exacerbated. But this, the things that my um, autistic students um, and my ADHD students, all my neurodivergent students, they're they're concerned about the same things my neurotypical students are. It's just it it impacts them to a much greater degree, so they grow very frustrated. Now I remember in a corporate role a long time ago, in my different career life. And I was the only black person in this office. I had walked in into a um, uh, interview as a business to business sales role. And they asked me, well, you know, Wes, what makes you stand out in this interview? What, what makes you stand out from the competition? And I, it was like the sixth interview. There was six interviews in this process. And I was just, and, and they do that to kind of wear you down to really see if you're going to show your true self. Um, you know, being a black person in America and not even realize I'm fully ADHD, I'm code switching and masking. And I just, I just was done. And at a point I was like, well, you know what? I'm probably the only black person here. So that's how I'm standing out. And I just, can we drop the pretense and just get to the, like, just really show what you want. And I think that's a good point here for the um, Judy Singer Neurodiversity to Work Program, uh, helping corporations become more humane is step one to um, understand that there is corporate responsibility. Step two, have a job description that's um, is concise and clear and actually speaks to the job very clearly um, and work on selecting the right people for the job. And the right people doesn't just mean someone that is a rock star who has a go-getter mentality, who shows enthusiasm and stares you in the eye for 90% of the interview because it's not always 
uh, pertinent to the actual job? Well, you know what, I've got, I think we might be coming near an end, but you can certainly end on, I've got a note that you might want to end on. And I'm just saying, I think everyone should read King Lear. Have so you read, do you know King Lear, the story of it? Uh, you, you, are, you are testing me on the spot. I have, but please don't ask me any questions deeper than that because it has been a long time. <laughs> well, well, I hate to give this away because I wanted to put it into an article that's going to, you know, a leading article. But anyway, I'm going to say it. Um, so what happens, King Lear has got an, as two, two neurotypical daughters and one Asperger's daughter, and he asks them to tell him how much they love him and the two wicked sisters you know the the psychopathic narcissist whatever whatever you're no, I'm, I'm messing it up now but <laughs> now let's let's put, let's start again so king lear uh, wants to give away his kingdom and he calls in his three daughters and two of them are self-promoting uh neurotypical things no, leave that neurotypical king lear right you can always cut this out too. You don't have to use it. I can, but don't don't have too much confidence in my editing ability. Let me say that too. Well, at least I'll see the real me then. But real us, I should say. Um, it's good to be real. We don't have to. Why should we? Mask? I'm all about being authentic. I and I love it. Uh, it. We should be accepted for our authentic selves. We we are not out here doing anything wrong. So the whole tragedy of King Lear was that he had one Aspie daughter who spoke the truth when he asked her how much she loved him. And she was saying, how am I going to fake? While the other two sisters were big noting themselves, um, she was thinking, how am I going to fake this? What can I say except the truth? That I, that I feel all that a daughter ought to feel. And that, so, and that was how the whole tragedy started because he fell for the hype. And I think every corporate person should read this as a kind of, as a... Mm lesson in hubris i suppose well now i have to go back and read king lear again <laughs> well I'm, i've actually nearly summarized it i should put it into my blog like there's only a few things that you naturally need to read the first speech where cordelia is just thinking about i have to be she has to be honest mm. can't sort of fake it even for her own benefit and then all his tragedy unfolds and the whole family is ruined. It's such an amazingly insightful story. I think she's one of the first aspects of history in, in literature. You know, a, a bit more of a contemporary story. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Judy. I'm the sort of person that, that I didn't know how to, I didn't know, here I was one of the first people in the women's movement and the, you know, the supporter of the gay lib movement um, anti-racism all of it and I could not demonstrate I could not I did not know what to write when they said demonstrate your commitment to what's the word oh, they have the word now demonstrate your commitment to anti-discrimination you know I can't do that yeah what are you really supposed to put in in, in a space like that I don't I don't what actually supposed to do I finally realized is that you just read through their blurb about how wonderful they are and just copy out a few lines. That's what you're supposed to do. Time again, you know, this happened to me in a lot of courses. You don't realise. I think you think you want they want you to be stand. No, they just want you to regurgitate what they just said. By the time I realised this, I was already retired. And like, what's the, what's the point of that for anybody? You know, I, I remember when I was working in the public service, I did have, sit on an interview panel once and everyone had to demonstrate their anti-racism. And yet my fellow workers who were on the panel were saying all kinds of things about Indians and, you know, whatnot, and totally not getting it, not getting what they were doing. Mm -hmm. You know? It happens uh, a lot. It happens a lot. And, and what are you really supposed to say in the middle of an interview when they say demonstrate your commitment to anti-racism? Oh, yeah. I mean, how, how could you ever answer that question? Well, I was unemployed for a long time. 
and um, because I'm partly because I'm female and because I've been a carer and I've been out of the workforce and all of that stuff, which we haven't even talked about the discrimination mm. against older women in the workforce. Yes, I was in this government program they force you to go to, and all it was was like some young person straight out of university would get you to rewrite your resume according to the latest fashion and you would just rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and people you know like women this you probably won't want to hear this anyway but i'm saying it now you can cut it out it's like i know there was an older woman there who'd been like an um accounts receivable clerk all her life you know and she was really good at that that's what she wanted to do and she had to do this three page thing about you know meeting all these different criteria and it was just ridiculous I'm mm. gonna, I have a good review I have a good resume and here I am writing all this bullshit you know her thing was her initial thing was three lines it said it all it ended up being three pages of guff and I uh, was full of doing this I hated it I had to do it the government forced me to do it right it sounds uh, like you have some experience as a career counselor at a, at a university. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I am joking, but it, there is that aspect of it where I'm having to essentially navigate students through a ambiguous process. And I have realized that I'm really just helping students decode things just like I had to decode them or my students on the autism spectrum have had to decode them as well. Um, I, th there was another question I wanted to ask you. We have a little bit of time. So, um, I think we, uh, looking at the time, we might have started at a different point um, than when I was tracking. But I'm still recording. Yeah, there were some conversations that you and I had, and you said something that really stuck out to me. Um, we were discussing our feelings about you know the pandemic and everything that's been going on. I mean, you can't have a conversation with anyone it's longer than five minutes not talk about you know experiences in the pandemic it's it's a um an incredible event an incredible phenomenon in our lives uh, you said that uh us neuro neurodivergent folks are canaries in the mine of irrationality Did I? and i i will i will not forget that and i i think that's pretty relevant to judy singer's neurodiversity to work program keeping corporations or making corporations humane. So could you explain for uh, us what you really meant when you when you said that? Because, uh, uh, and we've talked about this a few times. I, I just, I, I love that phrase. I thought it was great. Minorities are canaries in the mind when things go. Maybe I, I don't know what I actually said. I would, I would say minorities are canaries in the mind for when things go wrong, when there's too much scarcity. Um, we tend to be scapegoated more, excluded more. Um, I'm obviously talking now as a daughter of, as an Auschwitz survivor who happened to be autistic as well, double whammy. Um, so yeah, I know quite a lot about, about what happens to minorities and it's a, it's a worry and um, you know, what we're seeing is when governments incite, as we've had some very populist um, leaders all over the Western world who do their best, help, whether overtly or to, to point the anger of the people at the minorities, go get them, give them permission. Yes. That's what I meant. Um, and I meant... Um, Well, I meant that we don't really know where the economy is going. And if you are in a minority, you better be ready to, to do what? I don't know. You better be ready and prepared and organised. Because who knows how long it will last. Right. I, I, I appreciate that sentiment and I, I think it connects with a lot of people, uh, whether we are uh, neuro minorities or some other type of minority, since it is a pretty big category that um, just feel on the outside a lot of times. And that's one of the things I have appreciated about uh, discovering your work for myself, uh, stumbling onto it in my life as we tend to stumble onto great things and 
I've heard the phrase and then learning more about it and just feeling very connected and feeling like, oh, there's, there, there's another place for me that uh, gets to define this other aspect of my identity and who I am um, and my idiosyncrasies and all these other things. And uh, that irrationality piece, I think, is amplified when um, we are neurodivergent. Mm. Because you know, because you know you're being treated irrationally, and whereas the people who are doing it, they not they're not critical. Talking about in, one of the things I know about intersectionality, which I need to say because people sometimes assume that mm. I'm middle class, well off. No, I'm not. I'm at the as a sole parent with no family. Um, I live in public housing. I'm at the lowest percentile of income um, because I live in public housing. I'm treated as a second class citizen. Um, whatever I earn, the government gets back um, by increasing my rent, by reducing my pension. Um, I'm middle class by education. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things going on. I, I, was, uh, I came to Australia as a refugee. It was not easy not compared to what refugees go through now, which right. makes me even realise that it was so horrible for us how infinitely more harder life is now. Um, yeah. I just need to say that so those people make assumptions. Right. Well, it's been, uh, you know, a little over 20 years since... Um, your seminal work here, uh, your honors thesis. And um, what, I mean, what, you shared a lot of different aspects of your thoughts on neurodiversity and topics that I feel are related to neurodiversity because it's, it's a, a, an expansive and uh, ever-changing and growing uh, topic. How do you see the movement growing in the next, you know, few years, whether five or 10 or 15 or 20, how do you see it growing? It's part of this uh, swing from nurture, you know, that society and your parents create you and you're a blank slate to, well, some of it is hardwired. It's um, part of your genes and you can't, and you're not to be blamed for it. And that idea, I don't think can now ever be reversed. Mm. And that means, and that's what the neurodiversity means as a society we have an obligation to include everyone to to create a niche for them even you know no matter how high your support needs are you're still a part of society and you still bind society together because for every person who needs a lot of support there are people who love to give that kind of support so we're all in this together and to me the neurodiversity movement unfortunately it became associated with just disabled people, whereas it's a movement for everybody. It is, yes. People who give, who, who, who need love or who need help, and the people who love to give love or who love to give help. Or the, you know, it's, we need to find niches for everybody. And how that's going to go in a time of increasing scarcity, I don't know. Mm. But you know what? Change is two steps forward, one step back. Isn't it? Yeah. You need a mix of everybody, don't you? Like that's and that's the thing. We are neurodiversity says no two people are exactly alike. Let's right. let's work with that. If they were, if it was easy, there would be no literature, there would be no films, there would be no drama. It's this is the way it is. It's 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 good, it's interesting, and yeah. behave well and be aware and listen and be curious. And I think we should end on that. I, I, I think so. I think we, we, we are, uh, in, in your book, you had mentioned a fondness for long titles. And uh, I think we, we added another layer to your neurodiversity program. It is uh, Judy Singer's Neurodiversity at Work program, uh, helping corporations become humane. And we're all in this together. Right, so there we go. Long, yeah. I don't like long titles, but um, but when you when you have, you, you can cut this out too. But the fact is that 
never mind the word, which I didn't even think twice about. I wrote the first um, theor theoretical sociology thing about the new, new social movement. Mm -hmm. And why did it, and like, I meant I had to squeeze it into 15,000 words because I would lose marks if I did more. And I had to give it a long title because it's complex. It's complex. It was, in, you know, oh, I had to explain autism to my supervisor who didn't know what it was. I had to explain mm -hmm. all of this. So I think, yeah, but you don't have to put this in, but I'm quite proud of that. That's what I'm really proud of. Okay. Um, we're at, we're going to get pushed back a little bit. Um, we'll take just three, four minutes here. If you need to take a quick break, we'll, we'll wait because that was about a 58 minute video. So if you need to take a break, take a break. Um, we got started a little late and um, we're going to go a little bit past 1130. If you can stick around, great. If you can't, we understand. Uh, we also have Judy joining us, which I wasn't sure she was gonna be able to come. It is very late. She told me she's gonna turn into a pumpkin, but <laughs> she is here. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna have a live response. Uh, we got a whole crew of folks here and we're gonna have a great time. So we're just gonna take five minutes we're going to come right back and we're going to and we're going to get to our live response y'all okay so J judy are you are you are you are you going to still be able to uh <laughs> you know i i am so appreciative that you uh made it and i i i hope you know that you did not have to but i am very thankful that you were here but you are on mute. You're on mute, Judy. Uh, <laughs> I'm testing. Hello? Can you there you me? are. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yes. Hey, Judy. Hi, Judy. Hello. I'm kind of hey. fangirling right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> All, all good, Marina. Hey, I did that the first time mm -hmm. I talked, and I just talked over her for like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope everyone stayed awake. Gosh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I'm horrible at editing, although I like it. Um, but I'm horrible at it. Uh, it's I, not I'm easy. Glad you did a good job. Stuff three hour plus conversation. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, if Very you authentic. listen to it, it sounds like it's a lot better. If you watch it, you're like, mm, that transition. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Wait, my glasses, just a moment. I, I like leaving that stuff in. You know, as somebody who works in senior leadership in the corporate world, I have to put on a mask all the time I have to perform all the time and I think it's a great relief when we when we can see just authentic conversations between you know neurodivergent folks not having to mask not having to pass not having to fool anyone so I'm, I'm appreciative I, I I I agree I agree and um Judy, uh, at the very beginning of today, we had some technical issues, which, you know, we're, we're, we're in a global pandemic and we're all trying to do things the best we can and we're all juggling a lot. So I tried my best to not get stressed out by that. But uh, we had some technical issues and we were just listening to me ramble on for a little while as things got set up. And I was commenting to everybody and folks who are still listening now will know this too, about how you were... Um, Frequently, you had mentioned the, the, the phrase that you said, a habitually defiant person. You're like, I'm trying not to be a habitually defiant person. And I, I always identified with that because I have been labeled as a habitually defiant person, but defiant about the things that matter, I will say. So. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> 
There was a reason why I brought that up and I forgot because I'm over here thinking about <laughs> everything going on. <laughs> oh, we were talking about masking and all that other stuff. Yeah. So sometimes it's, you know, th there's a balance of of masking and code switching for, for me and uh, Marenica as well when she gets in here. And, um, you know, I, the older I get, the, the less I care about doing that. But uh, still, I uh, have to play the, play the role in certain times. And that was, that's always one of the balances is like how much, how much responsibility is on both sides. And the majority of that, the responsibility has been on the side of the individual. And I think it's, I think it's time for the organizations to have more responsibility. Mm -hmm. So probably, you, you know, we're, we're all here now together because Judy has given us the common language to talk about neurodiversity, but Judy, you're the gift that keeps on giving that term, um, being a habitually defiant person. Uh, I, I may have to borrow that one as well. That's fantastic. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that definitely mm. describes me also. <laughs> I think I said oppositionally defiant. But, you know, we're challengers. <laughs> challengers. The uh, disturbers, I think, is a is a common term in every. In that's every, our superhero team. Yeah. Well. When they make a comic book movie about us, when Disney comes around, right? Well, they had they already had the Avengers. <laughs> So what would our version of Wakanda be called? The, oh. <laughs> Neurotopia? We have to These have are the our, important uh, questions. Neurotopia. <laughs> <laughs> I love oh. that. Hey, Marina Kay. Hey, I'm feeling neuro Neurotopia. I lied to y'all. I was hoping to eat before the break, but being that hubby ate the last of my hummus, I now have to eat something else. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly. Marina K, you're looking neurofabulous as always. Thank you. Yeah, neurofabulous. <laughs> Man, that, was, that was very good. So yeah, my, my Dragon Ball necklace on. Yeah. <laughs> I love Marina K. This is so good. She brings all my like nerd qualities to the forefront that I can just like embrace. Right. Um, team blurred up in here. Team blurred. <laughs> So, uh, uh, Christina, my wonderful graduate assistant, if you could monitor the chat, because I know people have questions and little Q&A panel and I, you know, uh, you know, I get um, <laughs> distracted as well. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have our team here and, um, <laughs> and yes, Christina said, I'll focus my ADHD powers away. Magnus, my please. My graduate assistant <laughs> is also a part of neurodivergent too. So, we're all, I know we're all virtually here in Neurotopia, but um, why don't we give quick introductions, name, sentence about what we're doing, where, where we are from. Um, Judy, I will have you go last um, because uh, we are saving the best for last. And uh, Magnus, why don't we go with you and then Amy and Marenike, and then we'll, we'll end with Judy and then we'll talk. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Magnus Hedemark. I am in Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, I know I've met some of you before. I hope to meet some of you soon. <laughs> and my pronouns are he, him, until we find something that fits a little better. I'm currently Senior Director Hybrid Cloud Engineering at Gap Inc. So, you know, this fabulous shirt is one of our own products. Um, and I was until recently a senior director at United Health Group. So I work with Amy at United Health Group. Um, we're old friends. Um, just really happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and this is Amy Root. Hopefully you all can hear and see me. Um, I'm in Stillwater, Oklahoma, of all places. <laughs> um, my pronouns are she and her until they can find something better. I love that, Magnus. Um, I work at United Healthcare. It's a it's an organization under United Health Group, and I'm a product director. And like Magnus said, we've worked together, and we tried to do a lot of wonderful neurodiversity things here. So thank you for having me. Oh, you're on mute, Marina Kay. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, sorry, trying to multitask and failing miserably. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, great to be here. And so that, that's a serious question, though, Amy, like, is it like, is there like a stagnant lake somewhere in the area like that is named after? I'm curious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um hi there's really so, still water here <laughs> okay cool yay so i love when the names are not fake like there's this part of this area over here called um in houston it's called pearland and there's like but it's spelled like pearl and and there's like no pears i don't know maybe there were once but anyway everyone um i'm marina k giwa onawu um i use um she her hers and they them theirs pronouns i kind of um you know, interchange between them. And of course, one of my children's iPads or phones or something is, is ringing while I'm talking, of course. Um, I'm coming to you all from Houston, Texas, where I live. And I'm just really um, happy to be here on this panel and to just be able to, to, you know, talk with everyone. I've been enjoying the discussions in the chat that we have. Um, I'm not really sure which affiliation to use. I kind of do a lot of stuff, but, um, you know, in terms of the neurology piece, um, got a lot of stuff going on. So, uh, but in adulthood, it diagnosed with um, ADHD and then later, oh, Eli, yay. And your name, last name is Montrose, but you probably don't live in the Montrose area. But <laughs> but I'm autistic. I was diagnosed um, um, both autistic, well, first, oh, cool. Oh, Autumn, yay. We all gotta get, gotta get together. But anyway, uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD and then later with autism um, in adulthood. You've got some other, you know, um, psych psychiatric diagnosis too and giftedness from childhood so just really happy to be here with you all and to be able to talk about all these cool things you're muted Wes I, I had to join the I'm still on mute party because it's Wes I think you're on mute and, and we're there and we're there yeah so um uh Judy go ahead and um Introduce yourself again and let us know what time it is in the land of Oz right now. Yeah, I was just about to. Hi, uh, I'm Judy. I live in Sydney in Australia, uh, New South Wales. Um, it's one, I don't know, quarter past one in the morning here. So my biorhythms are at a pretty low ebb. So, um, and like any interview, I can't remember who I am. So... I think we were talking about this before, like, what have I done in my life? I don't know. <laughs> well, as, as Magna said, you have brought us all together here because uh, you helped to write about this uh, sociological framework and movement that uh, many of us have come to find solidarity in, and, uh, and we appreciate that. And also, you know, we didn't know if Judy was going to be able to be here because it is really you know, late, early, however you want to define that, where she is. And uh, this is a surprise. We knew that it might happen, but we didn't know if it was for certain, which is why, which is why we recorded our, our conversation. So um, despite that it looked like it was daytime and the background of recording, that was a virtual background I had, uh, and it was not. So um, why don't we, you know, I had, there were so many questions. Let, let's, let's just start with uh, something that we were talking about during break a little bit here with um, productivity, neurodiversity at work, um, corporate responsibility, uh, because the primary focus of Students Moving Forward and Autistic Career Summit is about careers, and it is about entry into careers. I'm a career counselor full-time, in addition to being licensed mental health counselor and all these other things, and I work in the Career Development Center here at NC State. So we know that there's a lot more to life than careers, but career is a really important aspect of our mental health because it, it, at times for certain people, it can give us purpose. Doesn't always have to be the purpose, but it can give us a sense of purpose. Um, it can give us income and it can give us access to resources and the things that we need, but there are barriers. Um, and oftentimes these barriers aren't, aren't always necessary. And Judy and I spoke a little bit about corporate responsibility in the, let's see if I can remember this, the Judy Singer Neurodiversity to Work Program. Oh, God, not that again. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all in this together. So um, why don't we start with that? Judy, you, you got to say a little bit about yours. So uh, Magnus, Marina K, Amy, if y'all had, if y'all had all the resources you wanted, you were able to start your own Neurodiversity to Work Program. And that's, you know, that's a really big question. So we'll just focus on two things. 
what are two things that you would really try to prioritize in that program? Oh my gosh. Um, Amy and I actually have shared experience trying this together at United Health. And uh, I think for me, number one is getting authentic representation at the decision table. In other words, um, you need a neurodiverse panel of people deciding uh, how the program is going to work. It can't just be neurotypical people in isolation. And I think number two, uh, framing it up as a series of small experiments meant to learn and understand what are the systemic barriers to radical inclusion? How can we eliminate those systemic barriers and then shut the program down because we don't need it anymore? Exactly. Hopefully the end game is a short-term program if there are some. Again, we're trying to seek out points of exclusion. We're trying to reduce the barriers. This is a systemic issue. The workplace in my mind is inaccessible for a lot of people like us. And a, a bulk of the effort needs to be at the workplace and the in the processes and the um, in the actions that occur. So I agree with everything that you all have said, and um, I was listening to what you know Wes and Judy were talking about earlier during this is like that's like my third time listening to the thing. I just love it, <laughs> but um, but I, I I kind of want to raise another point that I feel um, gets missed sometimes. I feel like a lot of these programs that we have, I do agree that the whole point should be to, you know, make things, um, you know, inclusive to where, because they're beneficial for everyone, ultimately, for all, you know, universal design is beneficial for, you know, the most users. But um, a concern that I have about a lot of these programs is I think when you're starting at work, you're already starting too late. I think that, I think about like the analogy of the person who, you know, that was given a, a why are you applying for a job? Um, you know, and how you're not supposed to give the true answer, which is I need money, <laughs> like, you know, um, and so it's, it's interesting because like my mother was not, was, you know, undiagnosed, yeah. still is, but I'm con concerned that she, I'm confident that she's autistic and she had learned all this code switching in life in general, culturally, religiously, you know, language and so forth. But then also with, in terms of her numerology, she said, give an answer that's true, but won't make them mad. So I need money is true, but they don't want to hear that. They want to hear that somehow all these 16 year olds, really, this is like their dream aspiration to do this forever, which is not true. So she said and said, say something about, oh, I live in the area. So, I, you know, this is, you know, you know, because that's beneficial to you because you can get there closer. So, you, you know, but also it's not anything that's bad or I shop here a lot or I'm interested in your company. Or, so give a truth. So I think like a lot of these things start in the way that we teach our youth and our people to communicate in general because the workplace is inaccessible, but the applications themselves are inaccessible. The, the platforms that are used, the paper ones are too, the ways that we, even in terms of how do people know where to look or how to look. And then I feel like also we're, there, this, this is catering to a particular type of cognitive ability. A lot of these programs are married with universities or with corporations. And, you know, if we, you know, we can look very, very quickly at, you know, people who are neurodivergent and see that, Educational attainment is not necessarily the same as that in other populations. Um, and then there's other things and there's a range of, you know, of, of cognitive ability. And so what about people who are neurodivergent for whom that degree is just not going to be attainable? Um, you know, where is the neurodiversity uh, integration into like middle, you know, wage or, you know, like the um, CTE and so forth area? Oh, um, should I tell somebody else to describe code switching because I don't want to monopolize all the time. I, I, yeah, I saw that we are, yeah. Eli, we're definitely going to get to that. So um, uh, Judy, you spoke really a little bit, you and I had a conversation about masking and code switching and that sort of stuff. And you were talking about your experience uh, of how you don't identify as white, you identify as a Semite, which was your words and um, in your own history, your own family background. Um, for us, whether, uh, you know, wherever we are in this um, spectrum of being neurodivergent, uh, how, how have you navigated those spaces? You're, you're, you're a woman, you're um, Jewish, you um, have all these other 
aspects to who you are. Um, and you're, you know, you're a, an experienced fairy godmother in neurodiversity now. How, how have you navigated those spaces? Well, uh, I, um, I pass a lot and I belong to a lot of different groups. Um, and there's some often mutually exclusive. Um, it's not easy. It's not, it's kind of a bit painful, but we don't live in monocultures anymore. So maybe, you know, I have my, um, I have my, what my autistic groups, um, from when I started, um, uh, I started a social, I and a couple of others started a social club for autistic teenagers in Sydney. So I've got the friends that I made there. Um, I've got my, I live in a, I live in public housing, but I've somehow lucked out into a very wealthy area. So a lot of my friends are local middle class, like white people. Um, then I've got my, my Jewish friends um, and like, none of my groups really understand those other parts of me. And I don't know whether other people have got that experience. Do you have that experience? And it's, it can be, it can be painful. You know, it's like, I can't talk about race or ethnicity with my white friends. I can't talk about autism with my Jewish friends. I can't talk, you know, like, but that's the world we live in. Um, I, I never really have answers, you know, I just have dilemmas, so. Does anybody really have answers though? We're all just on this rock floating around in the abyss trying to figure these things out. And I, I don't think any of us have clear defined answers. We have our experiences, those things that we have learned from other people and we try to disseminate and uh, synthesize that information in a way that we find it meaningful. And, and sometimes it, sometimes it, it, it grabs other people as well. As your just, work not to be habit just not to be um, habitually negative about everything. Um, <laughs> I, I just got to say that, you know, it's also enriching to have all these different groups and these different ways of relating. So it's, um, it's all happening. I don't know. What I hear is that you've navigated this through really a, a form of compartmentalizing different aspects of yourself, different social groups. And, you know, Marenike and I are both uh, in doctoral programs. You're, you're, you're a little bit closer to being done than I am. I'm trying to get this thing done. Um, but, For real. <laughs> um, Marenike, I feel a study coming out of this because I, I my hypothesis would be a lot of neurodivergent folks um, regardless of race and ethnicity, feel that same way, that they are on the outside and that they don't really have a space where they, all those groups connect. Uh, and I'm not saying that people who are not neurodivergent, that neurotypical people do not experience this. My guess would be that we experience it to a greater degree. And, um, you know, uh, the more marginalized identities that you have, right, and we're talking about intersectionality, then um, you probably experience it to a greater degree because I have a very diverse group of friends. I have friends who, you know, doctors, lawyers, scholars. I have friends who um, still are in the streets doing other things who I love. Um, and I have friends who are professional athletes. I have friends who, and, and we don't, and neurotypical, neurodiverse, and we just, a lot of those groups don't interact. I am the common denominator. <laughs> Um, and for code switching, I probably sound a little different in some of those groups, um, especially if those groups are not racially or ethnically similar um, to me. It's going to, to be. Well, I'd like to say something about that. Um, and just that um, one of the things about uh, neurodiversity, different kind, I think ethnic or racial diversity are kind of vertical, you know, like they divide people into, you know, this, this, and this, but neurodiversity is global. It cuts right across. And so therefore we have a common language that we can relate to in this group. So it's kind of like um, the fabric of society has got these horizontal elements and these vertical elements, and we're creating this amazing fabric somehow that might, will maybe unite the world in ways we 
it's probably not going to happen in the next millennium, but you know, it could be a start. So for yeah, all of us, how has Nur, I'm sorry, Miranda, Kay, how, how, um, go ahead, say what you're going to say. No, no, I was just going to say, Judy, I just thank you for mentioning that. Um, and I'm, if we have time, there's some thoughts that that kind of actually generated for me about how I feel like theoretically that's the way it works, but I feel like it, in, in a sense, some of that shared experience has um, resulted in, in some other aspects of identity kind of being lost, you know, mm -hmm. as a result, but I, but I don't want us to lose the, the, um, the train of the conversation. That is... I, I think I know where you're going with that. And I, and I, I agree. Um, so let, let, let's, let, let's build on that, Marina Kay, because what I was, I, I love, Judy said that in two of our conversations, um, that um, these, you know, um, other sociopolitical identities at times, especially like race, which is real and not real at the same time, because it is mm -hmm. not biological, race is a social construct. And I don't have time to break all that down for those who don't know, but you can Google it. There's many videos and documentaries indicating that. So like, uh, what that means is Judy and I, Magnus and I, Amy and I could have more biologically in common mm -hmm. than Marina Kay and I, mm -hmm. and that, uh, uh, anyway, so um, ethnicity is a, a biological thing determined upon our um, origins of folks that we are descended from. And so that those can be vertical, but that neurodiversity is this horizontal thing. And I, I do find a lot of solidarity, but there is also aspects of um, some identities getting lost at points in time. So why don't all of us, um, let's go Amy, Magnus, Marina Kay, talk about how neurodiversity has been unifying for you, but also any other areas that you might wish that it was more unifying. Let's, let's go there. Oh, that's a hard question. Um, it it's been <laughs> unifying for me. Yeah, gosh, I can answer the first part. So, <laughs> um, you know, at meeting people like Magnus, for me, this has been a pretty short journey. I've been autistic, obviously, my whole life, but I didn't know till my late 30s. <laughs> and so immediately, I started seeking out my people, like, where, where are my people? And it took many years to find even one person that was similar, um, and that was Magnus. And, and it was through some other friends. It was interesting. I think building that community is crazy important. What was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Unity, and then areas where maybe you wish there was more unity. And it, and the area, and it might not be yeah. like that for you. It's OK. Yeah, pass. What about Magnus? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Sure. I, I, I definitely have some opinions and experiences on this. I think one of the things that brings us together, and I love the way Judy was expressing it in terms of almost like a tapestry, like there's the verticals of the things that we can see outwardly that are different between us, and then the horizontal, um, our minds. And, and, and I think neurodiversity has helped me through that common language of similarity of mind to get more empathy and understanding for the verticals of people who don't look like me. Somebody who looks like me in American society is going to have um, some advantages, some privilege. I'm sure where I'm at in my career is happens in part because I'm white, uh, I present as male, I'm tall. Um, all those things contribute advantages, success. But at the same time, through all the different things that are different about how my mind works, I have similarities with friends who don't look like me. And through hearing about their experiences, I like I'm understanding the neurodiversity side of, of like challenges and advantages in life that they have. But then that intersectionality, I think in a conversation with Wes, Wes, the way you described it, like being black was an accelerant to the ADHD experience. That really hung Opposite with me. Way around. Yeah, yeah. ADHD me to was the understand. Yeah. Like I'll never understand the black experience, but I feel like I understand it better through you telling me the black ADHD experience. So I think that's been kind of a unifying force in, in my life. I think what divides us, and this is something I feel, um, I feel really badly about, 
there's an autism community and an autistic community, I like to think. The autism community is largely dominated by people who aren't autistic, or at least don't know that they're autistic. They're the parents of autistic children, the caregivers, the people who offer services uh, to autistic people who decide on an agenda for us without talking to us, without consulting us. Then there's the autistic community. And it's people like me, like Amy, like Judy, like Moronike, and others in the chat, Bill, um, talking together about what we hope for, what we need, how we're gonna get there. And we may bring allies along with us, but those allies aren't telling us what to do or what we need. Um, I see all the time on social media, on Twitter, uh, combat, outright combat between parents of autistic children and autistic adults. And it breaks my heart. Yeah, that, I do not want that. Like those autistic, and the most common thing we hear every day is you're not like my child. Well, of course, I'm not a child. Of course it's not, we're an adult. <laughs> but when I was a child, I probably had a lot in common with, with a lot of your kids. And I think becoming friends with people like me, with others on the panel, um, you might get more insight about where your kid is at, what they hope for, what they need. And I just wish there was more unity there and more respect that autistic adults are grown up versions of autistic children. And we do speak for ourselves now. We do have our own voice now. It's okay, chew your food. You can take a moment, Renika. Like, really? I have to follow that, really. <laughs> <laughs> Magnus, you're so wrong. But, like, I, I, but, it, but you mentioned some things that I actually are um, kind of are a good segue to a few things that I want to share. Like, for me, my entire life, I was never, it was like never fitting in enough to this group or that group or this group or that group and trying to realize why, you know? And so, even when in people that are supposed to be your people, there's still a, like a, this gap or this barrier. And so the, some of the very unifying and very gratifying aspects of you know, the neurodiversity movement are, I can be with my people, I can be real, you know what I mean? And it's just so, so freeing <laughs> to not have to be that way. And it's some of the things that, you, that um, Magnus mentioned um, in Dr. Nick Walker's dissertation, because I'm a nerd, yes, I read people's dissertations. Um, there's some information about how despite being you know, um, in, in racially white, um, some of the experiences and communication and whatnot were, um, are in, in communities of color, they were a lot more accept accepted and, you know, and they were less frowned upon. And so I've noticed that, I think that neurology, but marginalization in general, I think, I guess the less people understand or know, I guess the more hidden, even though there's no, nothing's really hidden, one's marginalizations are, the, I think that's where the, the division comes because people don't want to worry about the other. So like, I think about my best friend who's white, but her, you know, she grew up with an immigrant, immigrant parents just like mine. Um, her father died young, so her mom was a single mom. They struggled, they were you know, in poverty on Medicaid at one point. Um, and, but people, you know, but yes, does her, does she have white skin? Is, is that white skin a privilege? Yes. But she, I had more, I had two parents in my home. I had a lot of benefits that people didn't see. So it's like, we both had some privileges. We both had some marginalizations. And so when I think about someone who is white, who's experienced, you know what I mean? Who's experienced anti-Semitism as opposed to someone who has not, um, or someone who's experienced dis disability discrimination, ableism, or um, you know, homophobia, there's an understanding of those, you know, of those areas of being othered. But what I think happens is because we've wanted our people so much, so long, we want it to, you know, we need to understand that there's still different experiences. Um, and a lot of times people will say, why are you talking about that? We're talking about autism, not understanding that for a lot of us, you can't, there, you can't separate autism from the gender, from the race, from the socioeconomics or whatever, they're all kind of, they all, you know, are interwoven. Um, and so I think people erase that and it makes a lot of us feel not heard. Um, there's checklists where they talk about eye color being, 
you know, people with certain eye color are more likely to be autistic. I'm thinking, well, a lot of people in my community, their eyes are brown. I mean, there's some ver um, variation, but not a whole lot. So are we just not autistic because we're not, you know, like there's just a lot of erasure and there's a lot of assumptions that don't um, meet everyone's expectations. And then the same thing with the parents and the, the autistic um, parent. And it, it frustrates me so much because I feel like it erases the fact that there's a lot of neurodivergent parents. They may not be autistic, but I feel like this, this division, this divide, um, erases the experience of those of us who've been a child and are also bringing children up into this world. It it um, it causes us to be, you know, okay, we just are we just this one element of our personality. You're just an autistic adult, so I don't want to hear anything else that you have to say about parenting or about education or about culture or about anything. You don't know, you know, and it's just very very frustrating and very um, very minimizing. I appreciate all of that, uh, Judy. You look like you had something you want to say, or or, or you just um, <laughs> uh, trying to, to, to maintain uh, at, at the awful. Oh, I'm just I'm just listening, um, and my brain is not very fast at two in the morning. So <laughs> just carry on. I'm sure it is. Um, it I'm is just taking it all in. So I I I when I hear this part of the conversation, it is very important to me as um, uh, a mental health counselor. And this is when I put on my mental health hat and I'm not doing counseling here. This is no substitute for therapy. So, um, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of hurt, right? And when we have, uh, I'm gonna say like multicultural movements, the most marginalized voices tend to get silenced in um, multicultural movements. And that can cause a lot of friction and division with these groups of people who have experienced heightened levels of marginalization. And you can even have groups within those groups that splinter off that don't want anything to do with anyone else because they are hurt by this. And these, all of these are expressions of hurt that people have had. Um, parents who are neurotypical or neurodivergent, right? Um, but really kind of talking about these neurotypical probably neurotypical, maybe not, parents um, with this, the autism versus autistic community specifically, um, it doesn't mean that parents don't have their own issues that they're working out. People hold on to a lot of expectations. And um, as a mental health counselor, I can tell you that uh, when parents, when people become parents, those expectations um, start taking a whole new form in their lives because that person that they are raising is usually not going to be anywhere close to those expectations. It doesn't mean they're not going to be great. They're just usually very different from those expectations. And that's hard for a lot of people to deal with. And that is a real and valid thing to address and work through. But what happens is that it gets overshadowed from their child who has their own life and experience, who would also benefit from hearing from other people who are similar to them who could help say, I remember when I was like that. I'm ADHD. I definitely have an undiagnosed learning disability. I'm, again, I'm a clinician. I can diagnose people. I know what a DSM says. I, I meet the criteria. Um, pretty much everyone in my family, uh, um, extended and immediate, is at least ADHD. And, and um, a few of us have diagnosed and very clear undiagnosed learning disabilities. And, um, and I'm a parent. Um, and, you know, my kids are young, I can start already kind of seeing some of this stuff, because um, they are very similar to me, but I had learning developmental dis de delays, I did not really speak very well until I was close to four and all these other things. And, you know, when in, I, I don't want to get like too rigid in like diagnoses, because the DSM-5 has its own issues that I won't uh, get fully into, but some of you know, but you know, the, when you are ADHD and you are on that like moderate to moderate to severe spectrum, which is where I am, moderate to severe, and I'm, I've managed this, um, you you share a lot more traits with uh, your autistic brothers and sisters and other family members of uh, other uh, gender identities. And that is one of the things that I have learned the older I got, and I have found a lot of community and solidarity in that. But like in a lot of these movements, the voice becomes dominant from, you know, a, a lot of the white folks who are in that space. So what I am always trying to push is how can we increase the volume on the most marginalized voices while recognizing everyone's humanity and everyone's peace to this? 
I do see neurodiversity as something that is horizontal. I do see it as something that is unifying. It is a, um, a theoretical framework because it's three components that um, reaches everyone. It's not just for neurodivergent folks. It is also for our neurotypical fam, okay? <laughs> like y'all are part of this. And when we understand that concept and we travel through the ambiguity of um, the messiness of a social justice movement, it creates space and understanding. But again, understanding when we all validate each other's humanity, right? And I, and I feel that that is, you know, if it was an easy place to get to, um, <laughs> we wouldn't have all these social justice movements, right? There's, there's a, it, this is hard. Um, so Judy, from your, from your wisdom, you are, um, are you 73? Is that correct? 70. 70. I, I apologize. It's the youngster. <laughs> I apologize. Um, your wisdom, right? Um, and I don't remember if it was in that one, but I intentionally pushed the envelope a little bit because I work with many people in the autism and autistic community and the neurodivergent community. And, and, and these people have been great. They've been helpful. Um, they've become friends. They have been supportive of me and what we do over here. They have helped my students get jobs. And I, we, have, we have developed an understanding in, in, in multiple areas. So from Judy, from your perspective as someone who is a um, uh, uh, defiant, habitually defiant, however you want to, however you want to frame that, but is also has the, the wisdom and a life experience as someone who is well-traveled, who is 70, who has seen a lot. What are some of the ways that people can help to increase the level of unification in something like neurodiversity without silencing voices that need to be heard? All right. Just a light question for you. I know. <laughs> oh dear. Um, you know, it's just a slowly evolving process is, is my first thought. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day, two steps forward, one step back. Um, it's about, you know, discourse, you know, like some people think that change happens through discourse. It's, like, it's not what you do. It's, it's all the conversations that are, that are going on. Um, and then, you know, within, it's, it's, it's human nature to polarise. This is Anthrop 101. Um, whenever there's scarcity, uh, or you say the tribe gets too big, there's not enough resources, people start to polarise for whatever reason. You know, it could be anything quite trivial. Um, and um, why was I saying that? So, oh, sorry, ageing brain, two o'clock in the morning. Um <clears throat> We're always gonna. This, we're always really gonna polarize. I know what I was gonna say. That it's that it's the perception of scarcity that makes people. As long as as long as people are doing quite well, they're not they're not breaking into groups. But the scarcity that we're experiencing now is artificial. And this is you know from a sociological political point of view. Again, um, too many people are not paying their way there there's there's too much of a division sorry the the rich the wealthy you know the one percent versus the 99 percent if if they need to release as long as there's that artificial scarcity people are going to polarize and how we can cut across that is by reducing inequality um I know this is hopelessly vague and unpractical, but you know I leave that to the practicality to the so to the psychologists how to get along. And there are divisions within the neurodivergent committee community. You know, there's that polarization happening there as well. Um, you know, there's it's aut you know there are questions like is autism a thing at all, or is it just a conglomeration of traits? Is that going to disappear over time? Because that, again, is a divisive 
sort of label. Um, there's a lot of, there's a movement to, in terms of the labels, why do we need them? Partly because of the welfare systems that require labels. We're a label-based welfare system. So you have to prove that you've got this disability and then cling to it. Whereas if we move to a needs-based uh, education system, welfare system, um, then you could drop these kind of mono, what's the word, monoculture sort of identities. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself because we do need these labels at this stage. So they're just some random ramblings at two in the morning. <laughs> Your, your, your random ramblings are are, are, are very um, welcomed. So just because we have uh, about roughly about 10 minutes, we started late. And so I, I appreciate um, all of this. Um, what, uh, just trying to like pivot the conversation here a little bit in terms of like, just trying to bring it back to like the work aspect and like being in a workplace and in a work environment and, um, someone had in the chat I saw earlier about like this whole, is this like a fad thing or stuff like this? And uh, uh, just a real quick point on that. I Sometimes, I, I don't know what it's like in Australia, Judy, maybe this is something that's common over there, but I know in the US people get really obsessed with like people who are abusing the system, right? Whether it is uh, statistically relevant or not. And it, almost always it is not statistically relevant. And I think that is the same dynamic of like, is you know, people claiming autism or ADHD or whatever as a fad is, uh, I'm sure that there are some people who do that, but I would say it's statistically irrelevant because it's probably less than like 3% of people who are doing something like that. And this is an assumption on my end based on other things that I think are similar. In the workplace though, right, we are still managing ourselves and who we are. Um, the, the Whether or not we are fully acknowledging our whole selves. We still bring our whole selves everywhere we go. When we're in these workplaces, whether interviews, whether working with teams in person or virtually, what are some of the things that um, all of you do to help manage yourself in these spaces? And Judy, this includes you as well. And so we'll go um, uh, Magnus, Amy, Marina K, Judy. Magnus, are you first? Magnus is yes. mute. Yeah, sorry, Magnus. Yep. Um, all right, I don't have my ADHD diagnosis yet. Ask me in a few days, but I'm kind of missing what's the question. No, no problem. So um, bringing your whole self in a workplace, what are some of the um, strategies, best practices, whatever, things that help for you, just navigating the barriers, the dynamics, obstacles, whatever it is in the workplace? Oh my gosh, I, I have to mask a lot. Um, I work in a large company. I mean, I, I think I told everybody I work I work for the Gap. So if you go to Gap, or maybe Athleta, Banana Republic, I'm part of the senior leadership team there. So the the things that I face are a little different than being, you know, a frontline worker, somebody who works in the stores, or somebody who's like an engineer building things. I lead a team of about 200 people around the world. And so the expectations of behavior on me are compounded. Like I have to behave like a manager. They call it the shadow of leadership. And there's this whole thing we were talking in chat about like corporate speak. Corporate speak is totally a thing. Like we never talk, we, we never use the word layoff in management. We talk about things like reduction in force or transition workforce, <laughs> workforce optimization, like, and it's almost dishonest. So as a oh, neurodivergent nice. person, well, no, as, thank you, Judy. It's not almost, it's dishonest. <laughs> and it's really hard for me as a neurodivergent person to speak the language of the shadow of leadership it's like I'm speaking a foreign language. I have to translate and it feels dirty. It feels like lying because in a lot of cases it is lying, 
or it's mistruth through omission. Um, but how, how do I make it a more comfortable place for myself and for, for others? I think uh, the, the double edge of, of that challenge I, I, I shared was also the great opportunity. As somebody who's a senior leader in this organization, I can set an example. I can just fearlessly go out there and be myself and in doing so, make it safer for others to be themselves. And over time, folks see that I can, I, I can dress like somebody who's not a corporate executive. I wear this stuff to work and um, there are no repercussions. So other people feel that they can dress as themselves to work. Or uh, if a manager on a Zoom call says to, to Amy, Amy, why don't you turn on your camera for this meeting? As a leader, I can very quickly jump in and say, we don't need a camera. If somebody doesn't want to have their camera on, it's, it's, it's okay for them to not have their camera on. Um, I do put my camera on a lot. And you've seen me walking around openly stimming. I openly stim. So here's an executive in this big company that's openly stimming on Zoom calls. It's that person who has their camera off and they're stimming, uh, hopefully they feel a little more comfortable knowing that you know, one of the big bosses has something in common with them, can openly stim, and there are no repercussions. So I, the, the, the challenges and opportunities for somebody like me are probably gonna be a lot different than for most other folks. Um, I know I'm speaking from a place of, of great privilege and great opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious what other folks might have to say on this. I guess I'll hop in there. Um, I do mask a lot. And I mean so much that I'm still trying to process the way that I mask. I'm still trying to understand it. Again, my journey of knowing what's been going on with me has been pretty short. It's been about six years. So, you know, I try to channel my inner Magnus, I guess, try to be the presentation of what I would expect of others, but I'm still trying to do those things for myself. Like, for example, telecommuting has literally changed the world for me. And if it wasn't an option, I, I genuinely don't think I'd be able to work. Um, and so, you know, autonomy over my calendar, I, I have to have that. So I know if I'm out of spoons, if you don't know what that term means, there, there are times where, you know, spending eight hours back to back of multiple calls, you know, task switching has been so hard. I'm out of spoons sometimes by midday. And so just normalizing that by saying, I have to take a break or I might not come back until tomorrow morning to finish my job because I'm incapable. <laughs> so I, I have to advocate for myself like that. Um, that, that, con that context switching or task switching is very difficult. So I really try to block my days and do larger chunks of work instead of 800 things, I do like five. Um, the biggest thing for me is unspoken rules and expectations. That, that has been very, I mean, if you think about it, it, it would almost be like me as um, an English speaker going to a completely different country, never experiencing their culture, not knowing how people communicate and experiencing everything new. But that's what it feels like as an autistic person in every situation you go into that you don't know. And so I have to assess the people, the culture, the modes of communication, every situation I go to, and that's a lot of effort. Um, and so I, I try to like let people know how difficult that can be. And if we could write down or verbalize expectations, that helps a lot. Was it Judy and then me? Sorry, I never remember the order. It is. I think okay, you, so because I haven't thought of anything yet. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, really, oh my goodness, like what uh, Magnus and Amy have said, we could just stop right now, frankly, because like, it's amazing because it is true. It's like the, um, you know, like there's expectations that one has, but the, the, a lot of what makes things challenging are things that are unclear, things that are vague, things that are inferred or assumptions that are, are, are made. Um, and, um, you know, the clarity is important. Being able to be oneself is important. And like, so what Magnus is saying is like, so I, I've tried, I've kind of accommodated myself throughout my life. Like I only apply for jobs in something that I know I like, because I'm not going to do well. I'm, you know, I'm ADHD, I'm on or off. <laughs> I'm not going to do well if I don't like where I am. 
Um, I find clothes that are suitable and acceptable for the business, you know, for the workplace, but that are comfortable for me, you know, that, that are not a sensory nightmare for me. I do openly stem in front of my students and I, I do make concessions. Like when there's meetings, you know, before my life didn't change a whole lot in terms of work before, after COVID, because I was already implementing telecommuting and I was already allowing my students to turn things in multiple different types of ways. And I already kind of had a lot of the, that stuff built in. And I think that having that flexibility is important for everyone it's you know regardless of one's neurology it just really um you know it, it makes things inclusive and it's something that i think that um it just you know makes for more efficiency mm. well is it should i speak now um so my problem was never in work my problem was always getting work for reasons that people have stated before that um, I didn't know how to self-promote. I didn't know how to, uh, dem you know, people used to ask, how did I solve? I know that I'm good at solving problems, but I could never think of what to say in an interview or how to. So that was my problem. Once I was in work, um, I was okay, I guess. Um, I mean, so my experience is really is very different from yours because, because I mean, I know it's bad, still not equal for women, but when I was growing up, you know, there were only about three or four um, occupations that women could have. And even if you're a teacher and you got married, you had to quit you know, and go, you know, become a housewife. So, um, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of changes and a lot of positive things. At the same time, I do feel that the pace of work has gotten has accelerated and when we talk about us being ADHD our whole society is ADHD and we're all struggling to keep up you know with the level of multitasking that's now expected of us um the the way that technology which used to you know like it changed my life when we first got the internet because for the first time I could talk about what you know with I could find my peers and um, but now technology is like this horrible Faustian sort of bargain that we signed where we wanted to know everything. And now we've got the world at our fingertips and it's overwhelming and the technology changes all the time and there's upgrades and they're actually downgrades. And sorry, I'm raving on. Um, but yeah, um, I'm really, really glad not to be to be retired, to be honest. But at the same time, because of the technology and the possibilities, I'm probably working harder than I ever have in my whole life. So yeah, it's an ADHD world out there. Thank you, um, Judy. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Marina Kay. I, I, I hope everyone else has appreciated this, um, this panel, or the video this discussion and this is kind of like well it's not kind of it is this is the beginning of the rest of everything else that we're going to do and uh, Judy thank you for your time I appreciate it thank you to IBM and NetApp for uh, sponsoring you to uh, spend your time with me oh, and, yes thank um, you I enjoy being able to call you a friend now and uh, and and to continue our conversations even after this summit is over um, I do uh, I am going to end on a question for this, I'm gonna put it up on the screen and I'm gonna get in, um, in full disclosure. I don't have the, uh, <laughs> the, the the paid version of this. I have the free version. So it'll, it'll only take 40. Um, oh, did I freeze? Uh oh. Uh um, well, it looks like you can hear me, but uh, the screen on my end. It says you're screen sharing, but then we couldn't see the, but, right, but there's there it says double click. There we yeah. go. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so um, I'm, and there's a reason for this. All right. So this is uh, free for y'all. Um, and this is free version for me. It'll take, um, and this is anonymous. I don't, I, I don't know what anyone says. So feel free to put whatever you want to put here. Um, who made this quote? Don't Google it. Don't cheat. Who made that quote? And you can use those directions at the top. There is a, a poll, uh, I mean, a link that you can use in a different browser, or you can even text it uh, to WJ Wade at 37607. This is a thing called Poll Everywhere I like because you can do some anonymous 
uh, questions and pollings. It's very good for classes to help them get some more um, honest answers to things. So while you put your answers in here for this last question, um, and I, again, I just want to continue to thank everybody, uh, because this is the beginning of this year's summit. And um, while this is a career summit, we're going to talk about aspects of career, and we're mainly focused on our um, autistic students here, as well as alumni and job seekers. Um, this is only one small part of this whole conversation, just one small part. Um, there are other people within the autism community, the autistic community who need acknowledgement as well, right? Uh, um, I, I work at a university, so I am working with university students, but that, that is not all, right? Um, and hopefully this grows. <laughs> so I put my name, that's hilarious. <laughs> Wesley, wait. <laughs> I did not say that, I promise you, it was not me. Um, that's great. And so <laughs> this is something that uh, I hope it grows and it grows uh, uh, beyond just uh, college students as well. Um, and so for the, uh, the theme for the rest of this is, you know, it's about work, it's about being your authentic self, it's about hearing from people who are autistic and on the autism spectrum to talk about their experiences and how they navigate, getting to hear from some employers and getting opportunities. So there is a job fair, career fair that starts at um, 3.30 today and goes to uh, 5.30. We have schedules that are on there now for uh, 16 or 17 different employers. There is a, a high school program for Wake County students. If you're here in North Carolina and you're a high school student and you have a disability, uh, you can register for the Catalyst program, which is a STEM program in Wake County. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but the, the, the underlying theme here is authenticity and who we are and how to understand um, neurodiversity, so if you put how to understand um, uh, neurodiversity as a point of unity, but while respecting everyone's humanity and the voices that get silenced and marginalized the most within that. Um, and so I will move to the answer to this question because my point for this is people are misunderstood. We don't know someone's story, but we think we know someone's story, but we really don't. And when we really understand who someone is, when we understand them, then we can decide if we're going to agree or disagree. I love doing this because usually everyone says Martin Luther King Jr. Guess what? It wasn't. It wasn't Martin Luther King. If my, come on, come on, slide. Oh, you're still in my thunder. Slide, move. <laughs> it was Malcolm X, y'all. Malcolm X. And people don't think Malcolm X said things like this because when we talk about Malcolm X, we really only talk about like the few years of his life when he was with the Nation of Islam, he left the Nation of Islam, which is not really synonymous with um, the, the religion of Islam. This is a, a kind of a different thing. Um, and if you read his autobiography at the end of the book, he was like, I want all people. I stand for justice for all people. And his life is a very interesting life because he talks about all these different facets of growing up poor and black in Georgia and not even realizing all these racist systems that were upon him. And when he realized that, it was like he felt the PTSD all at once and he left and he became Detroit Red and he did a bunch of things that put him in jail and almost killed him. And then he ended up in prison and that is where he found uh, the Malcolm X that we typically know, but there's more to his life, his short life after that. His life was about unity at the end of life. He, he realized that there was many mistakes, a lot of misogynism, a lot of other aspects in his life that he wasn't proud of. And when we understand someone's story, when we take the time to understand someone's story, then we can decide if we agree or disagree. Then we can decide what we are going to do to remove our own barriers to help. And that is what this is really about. So thank you all. This is the end of the first session here. We're going to come back at 1.30 and we're going to have a, uh, a quick uh, less than three minute video about the Lincoln Internship Program. And then we're, which is a great program for students on autism spectrum here in NC State paid internship programs, degree related opportunities. And then we are going to have some uh, recent graduates and current students who have some great internships. And we're going to talk to them and they're going to talk about their experiences and all the great things that they're doing. And then it's the career fair and then we'll see you back tomorrow. So thank you for coming out. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Magnus, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Marina Kay. Marina Kay will also be in the parent and guardian session, which will start at 1.30 in a, in a different Zoom space, um, uh, in addition with uh, Drs. Nicole Anthony and Dr. Jamie Pearson. And um, last but not least, thank you very much, Judy. I appreciate it. And we all thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Okay. Bye. Totally right. See everybody soon. Bye. Thank you.